So, Principles of Anatomy and Physiology tonight, the Integumentary System, Chapter 5. Uh, so, we're going to talk about skin, hair, oil, sweat glands, nails, and sensory receptors. Integumentary system helps the body to maintain its temperature, converts inactive vitamin D to its active form, provides sensory information, and helps maintain homeostasis in a number of ways. So this figure here is actually on page 171. I'm not sure why they put it at the beginning of the PowerPoint, but uh, if you turn to page 171 in your textbook, you can see this figure. And basically this just goes through and talks about all of the different uh, systems of the body and how the in integumentary system interacts with those systems. So you can see here that the skin helps um, activate vitamin D, and that's needed for the proper absorption of dietary calcium and phosphorus to build and maintain bones. Skin helps to provide calcium ions needed for muscle contraction. Uh, in the nervous system, it helps nerve endings in the skin and subcutaneous tissue to provide input to the brain for touch, pressure, thermal, and pain sensations. The endocrine system, Keratinocytes in the skin help activate vitamin D to its calcitria, a hormone that aids absorption of dietary calcium and phosphorus. The cardiovascular system, local chemical changes in the dermis cause widening and narrowing of the blood vessels, which help the blood to flow to the skin. And we'll talk about that a little bit later in this lecture. The lymphatic system, the skin is the first line of defense. Dendritic cells in the epidermis participate in immune responses, and macrophages in the dermis phagocytize microbes in, that penetrate the skin. The respiratory system, the hairs in the nose help filter out dust particles. Stimulation of pain nerve endings in the skin may alter breathing rate. Digestive system, skin helps activate vitamin D and that promotes absorption of dietary calcium and phosphorus in the small intestine. The urinary system, the kidney cells receive partially activated vitamin D hormone from the skin and convert it to calcitrol. Some waste products are excreted from the body in sweat and con that contributes to the excretion by the urinary system. And then the genital system, the nerve endings in the subcutaneous tissue respond to erotic stimuli, thereby contributing to sexual pleasure. Suckling of a baby stimulates nerve endings in the skin, leading to milk ejection. Mammary glands are really just modified sweat glands that produce milk, and the skin stretches during pregnancy as the fetus emerges. Overview of how the skin interacts with all of the various systems of your body to help maintain homeostasis. So now we're going to go back to page 150, and if you want to look at figure 5.1 on page 150, we'll be talking about that here directly, but the skin has two major layers. The epidermis, that's the most superficial layer. Uh, the skin on my hand, that's my epidermis. That's the part that you see, and the dermis is uh, deep to the epidermis. So just below my epidermis, I have what we call a dermis, and then there's also the hypodermis, it's also called the subcutaneous layer or the sub Q that's located deep to the dermis but not a layer of the skin composed of areolar and adipose tissue. And here you can see figure 5.1 and this just goes through the various parts of the skin so you can see that the skin is set up here in these kind of layers. It's really I guess the word for it is stratified so you see the epidermis and it's got this bracket here and what is the one thing you don't see in the epidermis well there's no blood vessels in the epidermis these are all basically just dead skin cells there are some uh, projections that go through them like for instance the sweat glands and the hairs penetrate the epidermis and then you can see the various uh, parts the epidermal pegs and all of these parts make up these various regions of the skin. See, the dermis is deep to the epidermis, and we can see here that the dermis is rich in blood vessels, and we have the hair follicles. Well, here's the hair root, and the hair follicles are located in the dermis. And then, of course, the subcutaneous tissue, which is just, it's got this yellowish 
um, kind of these oval shaped cells, if you will. And that's just your book's representation of adipose tissue, which adipose tissue is just kind of fat, for lack of a better term. So you can see that's an overview of the skin. And now we get a little bit closer look at the skin through these micrographs, and we can see here the epidermis is pointed out here, and then the dermis, and we see the root and then the follicle of the hair. So all of this is located within the dermis. We see a sebaceous gland here. And if we look over at this micrograph, well, we can see this is a little bit more detailed. So this is 60 times magnified. This is 250 times magnified. So you can kind of get a little bit closer look at all of the different uh, layers of the skin. These stratum, or strata as they're called, should be on the next page. But uh, this is then uh, figure 5.1 continued. Okay, so but this is actually on page 151. So you can see there's more micrographs, and we see the epidermal ridge, and it's just uh, 100 times the relationship among the epidermal ridge, the dermal papilla, and the epidermal peg. And if you remember, we saw those in this cartoon, the dermal papilla, the epidermal pegs. And this is a picture here of a close-up of a fingerprint. So you, if you look closely, you can see the sweat pores there, and you can see these things called epidermal ridges. This is oh, so this is a scanning electron microscope image. So this is a very, very close view of the epidermis and the dermis. So this is a very interesting picture. And you can see uh, this papillary dermis and this reticular dermis in very great detail. So now we're going to turn the page to page 152. And now this is actually on the right hand side of this slide. This is actually figure 5.2. And so uh, the epidermis contains four major types of cells, keratinocytes. So they're composed mainly of the keratin. You got the melanocytes. And we'll talk about melanin in more detail as we progress through the, the lecture. But this kind of a cell is something that is a major contributor to skin color. The intrepidermal macrophages. So if this is a macrophage, this is telling me that it's, yeah, this is some kind of a white blood cell, I believe. That's what macrophages are. So anyway, the tactile epithelial cells, you can see that this is where the uh, nervous system is going to get its input to take to your brain so you can react to whatever uh, stimulus you may be stimulated by types of skin. So we have thin or hairy skin that covers all body regions except the palms, palmar surfaces of the digits, and the soles of the feet. And then we have thick or hairless skin that covers the palms, the palmar surfaces of the digits, and the soles of the feet. The epidermis is composed of four layers in thin skin and five layers in thick skin. They are from deep to superficial in this little checklist here. Stratum basal, stratum spinosum, the stratum granulosum, the stratum lucidum, and the stratum corneum. And the stratum lucidum is only present in the thick skin. So recall the difference between thick and thin skin. The thick skin is the hairless parts of your body, and then the thin skin has hair protruding through it. And this figure you can see on page 152 as well. And this is just another uh, close-up of the epidermis uh, showing the different strata that we were just talking about. Remember I said that the skin is uh, made up of these layers or these strata. And you can see the different strata. Uh, so this part obviously, well, well it says it right here. I was going to outline it for you. But the dermis is deep to the epidermis. So always keep that in mind. The dermis is deep to the epidermis. Dermis, deep, get it? They both start with a D. So this table here uh, just kind of goes through the various stratum, and this is on page 154, table 5.1. And you can see the various, they call it stratus, I call them strata. The basal is the deepest layer, uh, composed of a single row of cuboidal or columnar 
keratinocytes. The spinosum is eight to ten rows of many-sided keratinocytes with bundles of keratin intermediate filaments, contains projections of melanocytes and dendritic cells. The granulosum, three to five rows of flattened keratinocytes. The lucidum, present only in the skin of the palms, so that's a good one to remember. The lucidum is only found in the thick skin. And then the corneum, which is few to 50 or more rows of dead flat keratinocytes that contain mostly keratin. Table 5.2 summary. Let's see here. 5.2 is on page 155, so you can read in greater detail about that. But the dermis is composed of connective tissue containing collagen and elastic fibers. So the region is the papillary, and that's the superficial portion of the dermis. And that makes up about one-fifth of the dermis. And then the reticular is the deeper portion of the dermis, and that's about four-fifths of the dermis. Remember, this is just, we're talking about the, the layers of the dermis now. So we are dividing the dermis up into these two layers. And we were talking a little bit about melanin earlier. So uh, melanin has to do with the skin pigments and the skin colorations. Melanin is produced by melanocytes in the stratum basal. Femelanin is yellow to red, and eumelanin is brown to black. Hemoglobin is the red pigment in blood cells, and carotene is yellow to orange pigment stored in the stratum corneum and adipose tissue. And I've actually seen bodies open before. If you see like the adipose tissue, it's always yellow, and that's the carotene contributing to that color. And of course, all of us have probably seen blood, and you know, blood's red, and that's why, because it has a red pigment in the blood cells, the hemoglobin does. And then if we were in physical class right now, I would ask you to look around the room because surely you would see people of all different uh, shades and colors. And that is a result of melanocytes and melanin. Now, people have roughly the same amount of melanin in their cells. So people with darker skin, you can't say they have more melanin than people with lighter skin. It's just their melanin has a different pigment to that. And that gives them a darker shade. Whereas a person with lighter skin has the same amount of melanin, but the melanin is just a different shade. So it gives the skin a different color. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about albinism and vitigulo. And uh, albinism is just the inability to produce melanin. So when a person doesn't have melanin, then you really see that they have very white hair and red eyes and very, very light skin. That's because it's resulting in the absence of the pigment in the skin, hair, and eyes. So, And then uh, vitigulo is a chronic disorder. So if you've seen somebody with patches of white spots on their skin, uh, that's just because that particular part of their body has lost the ability to produce melanin. So it's related to the immune system, it's, so it's basically an autoimmune disease. Remember, an autoimmune, that means that your body's own defenses are actually attacking your body. So your antibodies in that portion of your body, if you have a, a white spot on your body, is just your antibodies attacking your melanocytes, and that's uh, creating this discoloration of skin. Hair is something that we would call an accessory of the skin, and this is located on page 157. Present on most body surfaces, except the nipples, the palms, the palmar surfaces of the fingers, the soles of the feet, the plantar surfaces of the toes, the labia minora, and the prepuce of the penis. So those are all of the places in the body that should be lacking hair. Hair is composed of dead, keratinized epidermal cells bonded by extracellular proteins. And it's also uh, genetic and hormonal influences that can determine the thickness and distribution of our hair. So some people, they may have different patterns of hair. Or, um, sometimes uh, you can see, especially in men, you can see that they have this thing called male pattern baldness where uh, they start to lose their hair and they may have like a, a bishop's crown or uh, they may be completely bald. And that's just uh, due to genetic and hormonal influences. So here we see the accessory hair and its various parts. And we're looking here on the right, we're looking at a scanning electron microscope image. And we can see parts of the hair include the shaft. And that's probably the part that you most readily see. 
the follicle, and that's below the skin level, and then the root penetrates into the dermis. So the root has also an epithelial root sheath and then a dermal root sheath. And this is actually, I'm lecturing from page 158, figure 5.4. So now we're going to go and see this whole figure here. And so we can kind of get an, an idea here of, so here's your epidermis, and then here's the dermis. And here's your sub Q down here with this adipose. So that's one way that if you see a, a figure like this, you can always tell by the adipose tissue that you're in the sub Q layer. But we can see that we've got some sweat glands here, and we've got a hair bulb, and we've got this root plexus. So this leads us up, and then the, the root of the hair is going to penetrate through the epidermis, and then it grows, and that's the part that is visual and you can see it. Maybe you have some hair on your arms, maybe you have some on your head. And then this just goes into great detail of the various uh, layers of the root here. So you can see it's got a medulla, a cortex, a cuticle. And then if we look at the hair follicle, it also has some various layers. This is that uh, root sheath that we were talking about. So it has uh, both an internal and an external one. And then here's the dermal root sheath which uh, goes even deeper into the integumentary, the skin. And then here we see a cross-section of the hair, so it almost kind of looks like a tree. If you've ever seen a cross-section of a tree, it looks similar to that. It's not, obviously, but it does kind of resemble that. That's basically your hair in great detail. And again, that's figure 5.4 on page 158. So hair grows in stages. Lecturing from page 159 right now. The growth stage, stage, cells of the matrix divide. The regression stage, hair moves away from the blood supply in the papillary and the follicle atrophies. And then the resting stage, old hair root falls out and the new growth begins. So much like your skin, how you're only sloughing off external, the superficial part of your skin, it's kind of the same thing with hair. Your, your hair is constantly growing and going through this kind of life cycle, if you will, of how the hair will fall out and then the new hair growth begins. So there's three types of hair you should be familiar with. Lanugo, which that is the hair that covers the fetus. And then the terminal hair, so that's going to be the, the hair that's coming out of your head, the hair that's on your, your arms or your legs or your chest, wherever you may be growing hair. And then the uh, vellus is this short, fine, and very pale hair. The colloquial term for vellus would be peach fuzz. So if you have some light hair around your face, and this is more common in women than men because men will have the terminal hair on their face because they can grow mustaches and beards. But women, generally, if they have hair on their face, it's this vellus or this peach fuzz. And even sometimes prepubescent, Males will also maybe have a peach fuzz before they can actually start growing the terminal hair. So it's just kind of a sign that, you know, he's getting ready to mature and moving into puberty when you start seeing increased amounts of peach fuzz. And then once he shaves that off, then that terminal hair is going to come, come back in. And, but those are the three types of hairs that uh, are associated with the human body. So hair color is permanently is primarily due to the amount and type of melanin present in the keratinized cells of the hair. So remember we talked about two different types of melanin, the eumelanin. And we've got for uh, the darker hair colors and then the blonde and red hairs, they've got some variations of the uh, phenomelanin. And then the gray hair is a progressive decline in melanin production. So uh, whether you have blonde hair or dark hair, red hair, doesn't matter. As you age, the melanin will start to degrade in, in your hair, and then that will start to kind of turn your hair into gray. And then when a person has white hair, um, that's a complete lack of melanin. So you see that in elderly people and also in albino people, as we pointed out earlier. Um, three types of glands that are found in the skin. And the first one we'll talk about is sebaceous glands. 
and sebaceous glands, they basically produce oil and they're uh, frequently connected to hair follicles. The sudoriferous glands are the sweat glands and then you've got the eccrine and the apocrine. And the ec eccrine are the most common of the sudorif sudoriferous glands and the apocrine are located mainly in the hairy skin areas. Ceremonious glands are modified sweat glands located in the ear, ear canal. So the ceremonious glands are the glands that are going to produce the earwax. Feature here, uh, this is table 5.3 on page 161. So I'll let you go through that on your own time. There's some good information in here. That brings us to nails, and nails are another accessory of the integumentary system, and they're made up of keratinized epidermal cells, and we can see the uh, structure of the nail here. The distal end of the nail is what we call the free edge, and then this more uh, proximal area is the uh, nail body, and then you've got the lunule of the nail, which is that little white portion that's just above the epinechium and then of course you've got the nail root down here below the epinechium. So here we just see some micrographs of the nail and I'm lecturing now from figure 5.5 .5 on page 162. So uh, all of those structures, the nail root, the epinechium, lanula and nail bed and nail body you can see here in greater detail on this cartoon. So the nail root is the portion that's not visible. The epinechium is the stratum corneum of the epidermis. The lanula of the nail is the crescent shaped white area of the nail plate. The nail bed is the skin below the nail plate. And then the nail body is the visible portion of the nail. And of course, as I said, you've got the free edge and these various uh, parts of the finger. And then here we've got a pictomicrograph of a fingertip. And this is a light microscope image magnified five times. So you can see all of those various parts um, under a light microscope if you look at this. Figure. So as we've already established, there's basically two types of skin. And this is on page 163 at table 5.4. So the distribution of thin skin is all over the body except areas such as the palms, palmar surfaces of the digits, soles of the feet, and plantar surfaces of the toes. We've already said that. And then the thick skin are those areas that lack hair, uh, such as the palms, palmar surfaces of the digits, soles of the feet, and plantar surfaces of the toes. You can see their thicknesses here. And then the epidermal strata. Remember, the strata is just the, the layers of the epidermis and the dermis and then the sub-Q. The way that I like to remember this is basal is the base. So that's going to be the deepest. Your deepest strata is the basal. So always keep that in mind. Uh, if you were to approach that on a quiz or an exam, then you would know which one is deep and which one's superficial. And then, of course, we see this table continued, and we see. I guess the main point I want to, main thing I want to point out here is that the hair follicles are uh, present in the thin skin, but absent in the thick skin. The sebaceous so glands are present in the thin skin and absent in the thick skin. Then, on the other end of the spectrum, though, you've got the sudoriferous glands, which are fewer in the thin skin and more numerous in the thick skin. So the skin has several functions to it. The thermal regulation, it acts as a blood reservoir. It serves to protect you from various things like microorganisms. It has cutaneous sensations, which means that your nervous system will pick up stimuli from the environment and allow you to react to that. Excretion and absorption. So an example of excretion would be if you sweat. And an example of absorption is there is uh, some adipose tissue that helps to keep water out. There are some uh, subs or some compounds that are actually water soluble that can actually diffuse into your skin. We'll talk about those as the lecture progresses. And then of course the synthesis of vitamin D which is activated by the sunlight. 
So thermal regulation. So one of the ways that we regulate our body thermally with the skin is through sweat and then blood flow to the dermis. So the blood actually helps to keep the dermis cool. And then sweat, of course, is one of our mechanisms for cooling off our body. If we were to exert physical activity and start sweating, then that sweat is going to appear on the surface of your skin. And then when the air hits it, it helps to evaporate that and that cools off your your skin and helps to keep your body in homeostasis. So the blood reservoir, well, how about this? The dermis has so many blood vessels that it can hold about 8 to 10% of the total blood flow while an adult is at rest. Hmm. Something to think about. Protection, keratin, lipids released by lamellar granules, sebum, which is basically the oils that your sebaceous glands produce, acidic sweat. So what I mean by acidic sweat is that when you sweat, your pH is going to be low, and that helps to kill microorganisms that may be on your body. Melanin, melanin helps to protect your body from UV light. And then macrophages, which are basically uh, one of your first lines of defense. If you were to get a, like a mechanical cut, on your finger, maybe you get some swelling and then you get some heat and those macrophages are rushing to that area because they're going to stop any kind of foreign or microorganism that may be harmful to you from getting in, considering your immune system's healthy. So cutaneous sensations, the skin contains different types of sensory receptors found in different layers. So you've got the tactile sensations, which is touch, pressure, vibration, tickle, so, you know, if somebody's tickling you, it might make you laugh because you can feel that and you're getting that sensation. Thermal sensations. So I can tell, well, it's not cold in here, but it's not warm either. It's pretty regular. I'm pretty comfortable right now. So, But if I went outside, I would definitely feel thermal sensation would be cold. And then, of course, pain. If you have some kind of injury or something, then that skin, is there's going to be receptors in there that are going to tell your nervous system that, hey, this hurts, and maybe we need to do something about it. Excretion and absorption. So the excretion is the elimination of substances from the body, and absorption plays the role of passage of materials from the external to the internal environment. Uh, so an example of uh, something that may be absorb absorption would be cause a transdermal drug, but that would just be like a topical, like let's say you went to the gym and you did some exercise and now your muscles hurt. So when you get home, you put some icy hot on your, on your muscles and it tries to help you to feel better. Excretion, we've already talked about an example of that would just be sweat. And then the synthesis of vitamin D. So the UV rays activates the precursor molecule that allows vitamin D to be made. That, that molecule is what we call calcitrol. And then vitamin D aids in the absorption of calcium from foods in the gastrointestinal tract. So vitamin D helps you to digest calcium, essentially. So we'll basically be talking about two different types of wound healing tonight. And the first one, this is on page 166 right now at figure 5.6. So you can see this is what we call a superficial wound. So have you ever noticed that if you if you cut your finger, sometimes you don't bleed? Well, remember that in the layers of the skin, the epidermis has no blood vessels. So it makes sense that you could superficially cut your your skin and not bleed. And I guess that if you were to cut your finger and you ble you were to bleed, then you would know that you've cut your finger deep enough to go down into the dermis. But if you just cut your finger a little bit and there's no blood, then you know that, well, I've just cut down to the epidermis. I'm not into the dermis yet. Paper cut's a great example. You know, if you get a paper cut, you know, a lot of times there's no blood with that. So that just means that, you know, you've got this, this cut that's just went into the epidermis. It's just very superficial. So we can kind of see here what happens is that these epithelial cells are dividing and then they're detached enlarged basal epithelial stem cells migrating across the wound. So your body starts to kind of repair itself that way. And that's the division of the epidermal stem cells in the stratum basal and migration across the wound. And then we see the epidermis thickening. That's an epidermal wound healing. 
And then additional steps that occur when the injury extends into the dermis or the subcutaneous layer. So we start to see then that we get this blood clot. And that's one of the first things that would happen is that you notice that you get swelling and it may even feel a little bit um, hot because you get heat. And that's just your body's first line of defense. It, it wants to heat up the area because that helps to kill microorganisms because some microorganisms need to live in a certain temperature range. So when you cut the skin down that deep, then that blood is going to start to clot. You might get some swelling and some heat going on. And then eventually it forms a scab, which is really just a blood clot. And then you see here beneath the scab, if we compare letter C to letter D, the inflammatory phase, see how the, the wound is going completely through this layer. This layer is now kind of rejoined itself, but you've still got this blood clot. So that's really all that a scab is, is just a blood clot left over. And I wouldn't recommend picking off a scab because sometimes it still might not be completely sealed up. But you can see through this cartoon that that's kind of what's happening is that this my resurfaced epithelium is being put back together and that's eventually going to push the scab off much like these layers of these dead cells over time you know as you your body makes more and more skin cells and they get pushed superficially that way and then they eventually slough off and that's what will happen to the scab as well so in the inflammatory phase the clot forms in the migratory phase the clot becomes a scab the proliferative phase, the growth of epithelial cells occur, occurs beneath the scab. And in the maturation phase, the scab sloughs off once the epidermis is restored. So let's talk about the development of the integumentary system, and that starts on page 167. And this figure here uh, goes for three of these PowerPoint slides, but you can see that on page 168, figure 5.7. Uh, zygotes formed, and then as a um, zygote matures into a fetus, we see that there's basically this uh, progression of how the skin is formed. So by the fourth week, you've got the ectoderm and the mesochyme formed. And then by the seventh week, you've got the periderm and the base basal layer. After 11 weeks, we see an intermediate layer here, an epidermal ridge. And then see here, here's the basal layer. We've got the dermal papilla, the melanoblasts, and then the developing collagen and elastic fibers down below, deep to the intermediate layer. 12 weeks, so uh, we see a more defined basal layer, and then we see buds developing to form the sudoriferous glands. And we also see another bud here forming. It's going to start to turn into hair. And by 14 weeks, we see the developing sudoriferous glands and then developing sebaceous gland here. See how it's a little bit off to the kind of, well, I guess maybe a better word would be adjacent to this, what's eventually going to be a hair follicle. That's right, your book's calling it a hair bulb at this point, but eventually it'll turn into a follicle. 16 weeks, so this stuff's happening pretty quick, right? I mean, 16 weeks, it's not very much time, considering the pregnancy's nine months. So we see the developing of this, more development of the sebaceous gland. The hair shaft is starting to form. Hasn't quite uh, penetrated the epidermis yet. And then the papilla of the hair. So it's starting to form in here. you got the sebaceous gland going on. And eventually this will turn into a root, a hair root. Yep, yep. And there, there we have it at 18 weeks. Here's the root. And then you've got the shaft. Sebaceous gland looks pretty good. And then at birth, uh, well, uh, we've got the epidermis and the dermis. Some melanocytes in there, and here's all of your strata that we talked about. Remember the stratum basal is always the, the deepest, base basal, deepest. And then the stratum corneum is the most superficial layer. So you can see... 18 weeks and then at birth so you can see there the big difference there but I don't see any it's showing that but it doesn't it's not showing any sweat glands or um, hair pushing through so the dermis develops from the mesoderm so the mesoderm gives rise to the mesenchyme 
here we are at the fourth week. We've got the ectoderm and the mesokine. And then uh, here we've got the various intermediate, the basal layer, and then the melanoblasts. And then here's this idea. It seems like we already seen this. This is just like a, a very um, summarized version of what we just witnessed, I believe. Aging. Starting on page 169, some changes uh, are associated with the skin as your body ages, as you uh, become older. You're going to see more wrinkles, dehydration, and cracking. Sweat production decreases. The number of functional melanocytes decrease, which results in gray hair and atypical skin pigmentation. Subcutaneous fat is lost and skin thickness decreases. And the nails may become more brittle. So we're going to talk quickly about skin cancer. This is figure 5.8 on page 172. But excessive exposure to UV light, um, so that doesn't only just include the sun outside. It also can include tanning salons. But that's the most common cause of skin cancer. And there's three major types of basal cell carcinoma. Basal cell carcinoma is 78%. Then squamous cell carcinoma is another 20% and then malignant melanoma is 2%. So there's basically three major types of skin cancer. And you can see this basal cell carcinoma is the most common and then malignant melanoma is the least common. And now you can see pictures of these different types of cancer. So you see a mole there, um, the basal cell carcinoma there at letter B squamous cell carcinoma at letter C, and the malignant melanoma there at letter D. So here's your early warning signs of the malignant melanoma, A, B, C, D, E. Asymmetry, then B, the border is irregular. Color is uneven, so let's go back and look at that. So what it means by being asymmetrical is that this blotch here, this cancer, it's not a symmetrical shape. It's not like a circle or a square that you can divide into symmetry. You can't divide this into symmetry because it's asymmetrical. And then the border is irregular. See how this border and then the color. So you see that there's different colors that go on here. It's a little bit darker and then you've got these tan portions here. And what is this kind of milky white? It's not even milky. It's more like maybe yellowish color I don't know whatever color that is it's different than this color and this this color so that's what it means by uneven colors and then uh, it's going to have a greater diameter than six millimeters so assuming if I put a ruler on this this would from here to here would be greater than six millimeters I don't know about this but certainly visually I would say that this is greater than six millimeters and pretty good with measurements and then this is going to evolve and change in size and shape. So something you want to keep an eye on then is how is this changing over time? Is the shape changing? Is the color changing? So those are signs of, warning signs of the malignant melanoma. So uh, we'll also talk a little bit here about burns. And we can see these burns, um, figure 5.9 on page 172. But burn is tissue damage caused by excessive heat, electricity, radioactivity, or corrosive chemi chemicals that denature the proteins in the skin cells. Burns are graded accordingly to their severity. So like, for instance, a first-degree burn is superficial. It's not deep. It's, I don't want to say it's, it's not that bad because if you've ever had a first-degree burn, it's probably not pleasant. But still, it just... It really just affects the epidermis, so it's really just very sur surface or superficial. And then we can see here that in the second-degree burns, this got some blisters going on, and that's affecting both the dermis and, excuse me, the epidermis and the dermis. So second-degree burns are more severe than first-degree burns, and of course, then with that logic, it follows that third-degree burns are uh, the most, I don't know what, what, what word to use for it, but they're the most intense kind of burn, I guess, because they go all the way down to the subcutaneous layer.
and then we've got this thing called the rule of nines, which is the way that in the clinic they may classify how a person is burned. And this is figure 5.10 on page 173. But the rules of nine is used to estimate the surface area of an adult affected by a burn. So this is they just score these percentage points to different parts of the body depending on how much they're burned. So if you're burned here on your on your thigh, you'd say that you're nine percent burned. But if you're burned on your thigh and on your shoulders, arms, forearms, and hands, then you may be eight eighteen percent burned because these add up to nine. This adds up to nine. And then the genital area, they're giving you a 1%. So if you're burned in your genitals, it's not as big of a surface area as it is on some of these other parts of your body. So that's all. That's a, It's just a, a way that in the clinic they try to measure these things and try to understand them better. We've got these things called pressure ulcers. Another a common term for those are bed sores. And then with age, you become increasingly susceptible to pressure. So... Patients that are in the hospital that are bedridden, they can't move, they have a tendency to get what we call bed sores. And you can see an example of a pressure ulcer. But here's an example of one. So there's ways that we can mitigate those, you know, by turning over the patient and changing their bed, bed sheets frequently and just getting them, you know, physically to move around a little bit to get them off of that part of their body so they don't develop these pressure ulcers. So that's all I have tonight from our lecture.